The entire team at the Emsolation Podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians and cultures of the lands and seas on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders and ancestors. We acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and stand in solidarity towards a shared future. I personally want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I record this podcast every week, the Wurundjeri people. I recognise their continued connection to the land and waters of this beautiful place I call home. Always was, always will be. M. Rossiano. I am an agent of chaos, but I'm an agent of organised chaos sometimes. And Michael Lucas. First we barrel the pork, then we pump it and dump it. This is M. Salation. I mean, your genes are very strong. <laughs> Thank very you. strong. I can't believe my genes aren't in there going, Scott, yeah! You're in M. Salation. Well, hello there, and welcome to M. Salation. My name is M. Rossiano, and I'm a writer, a singer, a stand-up comedian, a maximalist power queen, a neurodivergent magic brain, and a podcaster. And together with my best friend since I was 11, screenwriter and a podcaster, Mr. Michael Lucas, I bring you this show once a week, soon to be twice a week, I think. I think we're going to do it for you. Don't hold me to that. You know what I'm like, but I'm hoping we're going to start doing two a week soon. Well, it has been... Every time we catch up, it feels like the week that was is enormous and gigantic, crazy, unprecedented things happen. To all my loves, pals, friends in the flood-affected areas, especially in Lismore, again, I'm thinking of you all. I know you've been hit again this week. It's cruel and unjust and... The only faith I take is that I know your sense of community is so strong and, you know, I'm sorry that the government aren't there, but I'm really dearly hoping that they're going to step in much quicker this time. And, look, it's been, I'm coming to you from my house. I'm not in the studio for reasons you will find out in the podcast. But basically COVID has come to the Rossiano Barrow residence. It has arrived. It is here. We've been COVID ninjas for so long, but no more. I finally can let you know my big announcement. Last week we teased it. I teased it. What could it be? Some of your wild guesses amused me to no end. None of you got even remotely close to the news I'm about to share with you, but I think you're going to be very proud of you, girl. It's a big, long, raw discussion and Michael and I are honest with our feelings about the Oscars especially and I want to remind you that if you disagree with us, or perhaps you feel hurt by something we say, remember that it's important that we hold space for everything and know that Michael and I would never, ever deliberately set out to offend or upset any of you. But in situations like this that have sparked such a cultural divide and discussion, I think it's important that you allow all the takes in to your brain and maybe don't feel like you have to have a strong opinion. That's also something new for humans, especially online. (laughs) We're going to get straight to it because it is a long one. It's an important one. I'll also talk about Bridgerton. You know I binged that season two. You know I did. I do have strong opinions on Bridgerton season two. Don't worry, you'll be getting some strong opinions at some point. Thank you for being here as always. I hope you enjoy this episode. Yeah, I'm just making the best of my situation right now from home again. Again. All right, gang. Talk soon. Play the music. M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is M. Salation. Michael Lucas. We. We have had so many crisis phone calls about so many different topics in the last four days. Intersecting. At times it was hard to keep track of what crisis should take prominence in the phone calls. (sighs) It was wild. The Oscars, obviously, we must get to. A member of my family has COVID. We will get to... 
but <laughs> I wanted on the record that when you rang and spoke about Odie, I assumed you knew about the Oscars, but I just we dedicated the time and attention to COVID being in your family, and then like half an hour in, it emerged you didn't even know that it had happened. No, nah, I didn't know about the slap. But we'll get to it. The first thing is we've promised everyone last week I had a huge announcement to let everyone know I can't believe I've been able to keep this a secret because it's big. Can I just ask what the top guesses have been? The top guesses were me hosting Eurovision. Mm, strong. She is going to attempt the highest note ever performed at Eurovision. Replacing Carrie Bickmore on the project. Imagine them entrusting me to read serious news. Virgin's targeting key corporate routes, hoping to win over Qantas, excuse me, Qantas customers. I'd watch. <laughs> oh, my God. Getting my own TV show. I want a talk show with me as the host. You want to talk about current events? No. What kind of stuff do you want to talk about? Me. RuPaul's Drag Race. Like, oh. I would have been disappointed if that wasn't there, yes. <laughs> RuPaul's Drag Race hosting or, or judging. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> and no one even got close. No one even got in the ballpark of what my announcement is. So I'm going to let you know that on August the 24th, oh, my God, I feel nervous even saying it because I can't. Once you've said this, once you've said this, there's no turning back. It's out there. It's out there. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> All right. On August the 24th in the year of the Lord, 2020. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. I will be. Well, not 2020, I hope, because <laughs> oh, that shit. was a couple of years ago. <laughs> In the year of our Lord, 2022, this is how flustered I am, I will be addressing the National Press Club of Australia. (laughs) For two mega nerds, mega Australian political nerds like us, I tell you what, there's nothing bigger, there's nothing more nerve-wracking. It actually, I always used to say Q&A is the most nerve-wracking, but I don't think I'd fully absorbed Hmm. a, a solo address at the National Press Club. And I'm sure it needs no introduction to everyone, but National Press Club, that is where Grace Tame has rocked the house in recent times. Yeah. Every Prime Minister, you'll be looking at Laura Tingle, Stop Samantha it. Maiden. Stop it! Oh, my God. I'm peeking. And I got the official letter and, like, the last paragraph is, the club has hosted addresses from a vast array of visiting world leaders, heads of state, religious leaders business and community leaders, innovators, and, of course, every Prime Minister and opposition leader since the club's inception in 1963. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when they asked me, Emma McDonald, who's in charge of kind of, you know, booking the speakers and, and, she, and, and this, is a, this, is also, this is also, it's not only for the National Press Club, but it's also the women in media. So it's like it's a whole... Fierce, fierce ladies will be in attendance for my mm. little speech. And when she asked me, I immediately said, are you, have you made a mistake? <laughs> like, yeah. what? You couldn't actually open the email properly for quite some time. There was an attachment <gasps> and you spent quite a lot of time in the liminal space without actually clicking on the attachment. Oh, my God, I forgot about that. I did. I told you I couldn't open it. Didn't I send it yeah. to you to open in the end? We. We had an entire discussion, speculate. At this point, we didn't realise they had given you somewhat of a suggestion of what you could talk about. Because you hadn't clicked on it, we didn't know. So we were brain- What we were doing a full, like, half-day brainstorm about what it should be. And intriguingly, we, we landed on the exact same thing that they were suggesting yes. themselves. I will be giving a speech about neurodiversity, how it affects women specifically, the deficiencies in our mental health system, but also they want to hear about my story coming up through the entertainment industry and the challenges I've face and the triumphs I've had and they just really want me to I guess and it's I don't know if it's been done before but tell my story because so much of my neurodiversity is wrapped up in that even though it's a recent diagnosis it's colored all of my decisions and all of my life and I I don't know if I'm allowed to sing I'm hoping I can Has anyone ever sung at the National Press Club? I think you should be the first. First to sing, first to go on a random side quest that somehow talks about your husband shitting. (laughs) How am I going to control the side quest? The the side quest? No, you don't. I think you don't need to because consider what your speech is about mm. and this is a manifestation with you so it's mm. you could somehow going off topic is on topic and, <laughs> <so true. laughs> and 
like, what do I wear? Is this? Well. I mean, yeah. not to, like, obviously we don't reduce a woman to what she wears and the, the prestige and honour alone of being asked to speak at the National Press Club. Like, my mum nearly cried. Everyone I have told, and, I, and I'm trying not to be offended and I won't, everyone I've told have been like, really? Wow. <laughs> so so it's, it's huge, but obviously me being me, and you all know me so well, I can hold space for amazing achievement and also is sequins acceptable in our nation's capital? <laughs> can I do the leopard print velvet suit? I don't know. It'll be Canberra. It will It'll be, be after August 2022. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of things to consider. They wanted me to do it pretty much straight after the election. They wanted me to do it very soon. And I said, I need a good three months of panic. Totally. I need to get through my tour in May. And then once I've finished my last show, which I think is in Brisbane maybe, or Adelaide, no, Adelaide. Once I finish in Adelaide, I'll have June and July and most of August to truly, truly spiral. She has no right to lay this psychological burden on us. <laughs> yeah, it is going to be a dark winter. <laughs> In their Rossiano soul. As- like <laughs> mid-August is typically the coldest time of the year and there yeah. will be chills yeah. and darkness. As Ned Stark famously said, Winter is coming. And Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not even allowing myself to step into the arena or space of the emotion attached to this. I cannot at the moment. There's too much going on, uh, as I've, we briefly touched on. Odette, my middle child, has covid Mm. And I'm having to deal with that. I briefly thought I had it. Tested positive, no less. I tested positive, but then I'm like, I'm not sick. I feel fine. So I did, and I have five different test varieties in my house and I just did five different brands and they were all negative. So I went and got myself a proper test and that came back negative this morning. So I've thought I had COVID for the last 24 hours. <laughs> Your mantra of flats to the wall, I mean, I really didn't, couldn't understand how that would be manifested in rats testing, but evidently it can be. <laughs> oh, my rats is, I pull over on the side of the road because I got the phone call on my way to the airport because I was heading to Sydney for some t- two huge gigs and I pulled over on the side of the road immediately because I just spent the day with people doing a photo shoot and I thought, have I, like, just not knowingly given 50 people COVID? And I had, of course, I carry a travel pack of rats in my car so I'm pulled over on do. the side of the freeway, swabbing my nose. <laughs> you are going to end up in hospital and people are going to say, Amelia, do we need to talk about your crack cocaine <laughs> snorting <laughs> habit that you clearly have because your nostrils are gone? You're just like, no, it's a lot. Of, it's just a rat test every 17 to 20 so minutes. Many rats. I remember reading a story about how Coronation Street actress once lost her septum because of cocaine abuse. Remember that? Is that? A, that I really do remember that and it stayed with me. It Same. really has. Same. Well, I'm going to be the one who's got rat damage. It's true. Yeah. And not the, yeah. So all that's been going on. Everyone's okay and Odie's, Odie's quite congested, but she's okay. But, yeah, it's been a lot. So I cannot hold space for the National Press Club address just yet. But obviously, M Salators, you'll all be on the journey. We'll discuss outfits. I'll run practice speeches by everyone. I've got a writing team on board of Michael Lucas, Jamila Rizvi, Janelle Koenig, myself. Like, it's it's... It's the most important thing Michael's ever written in his career. And he would <laughs> dare say otherwise. I mean, would you? Would you? Would you not? You will be co-writing this speech with me. So very, like, this, I assume this will go on your IMDb. Like, I assume this will be top of your resume. <laughs> well, it is nationally televised. <laughs> oh, no my pressure. God. <laughs> Sorry, shouldn't have mentioned it. It's fine. So that's the announcement. It's very exciting. I'm... I can't tell you how emotional I was and how hugely honoured I am because I was talking to Rob Mills about it. Rob's going to fly up and be there. I sat out front of his house famously in 2012 crying because I had no money to pay my bills. I was living with my parents. I was separated from Scott and Rob paid everything off for me, as you all know, if you've read my book and seen my stand-up and believed in me. And he said on the phone, I I knew it. I knew it when you were, when I found you out front of my house that, Good things were coming and, oh, that destroyed me. That, that made me burst into tears. So, yeah, it's – but I'm not allowing myself the headspace. I can't. Oh, oh, it's too many conflicting emotions. The other thing that has been taking up all of my headspace is the Oscars. Don't Look Up is nominated. Yes. I guess the Academy members don't look up reviews. <laughs> and, I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio, what can I even say about him? It's, he's done so much to fight climate change and leave behind a cleaner, greener planet for his girlfriends. 
<laughs> oh, it's kept me awake at night. Same. Yeah. On Monday when it was happening, I was at a photo shoot, so I was in and out, and I saw that we don't talk about Bruno live performance with Megan Thee Stallion. <laughs> which I had to, like, shower off from because it was so exciting. Mm. Um, You were sending through, you were crying over the Best Supporting Actor win. Oh, yes, it was so many good things. And Timothy Chalamet showing up shirtless. And didn't we think Timothy Chalamet was going to be the talk of the Oscars? Didn't we The talk of the entire year, (laughs) I would say. Possibly decade. (laughs) I do think that look will be unsurpassed. Ah. I do think when we are looking back on the 2020s, we will go, look, ultimately, Chalamet 2022 Oscars. Yeah, 100%. But, well, yeah, so Troy Kotzer obviously won Best Supporting Actor for his role in CODA and he's the first deaf actor, male actor, to take out an Oscar. And his speech was just, it was, it was glorious. This is amazing to be here on this journey. I cannot believe I'm here. My dad, he was the best signer in our family, but he was in a car accident and he became paralyzed from the neck down and he no longer was able to sign. Dad, I learned so much from you. I'll always love you. You are my hero. And then I went away (laughs) (laughs) to have some photos taken and a lot of chatter was happening around me. Oh, Will Smith, Chris Rock, and I didn't really take it in. And then I got the phone call about the COVID. And so then I phoned Michael, as I do when anything major happens in my life. And I said, what's happened? What's happened with Will Smith and Chris Rock? And you, your head exploded. Yeah, yeah, totally. I was astonishing to me that something so <laughs> monumental, so multifaceted <sighs> had happened, so dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> and that somehow... It had, I mean, yeah, there were some pretty solid reasons why you were distracted. Let's yeah, say. yeah. But, I mean, this this event, obviously you all know Chris Rock went on stage to present also an award for Best Documentary who Quest Love ended up winning for his documentary Summer of Soul. So he was presenting an award about a, an incredible documentary about a music event that happened at the same time as Woodstock that's been largely forgotten by pop culture, even though people like Stevie Wonder performed and Sly and the Family Stone, it was huge. He was about to present that award. And so I don't know why he chose to do this. He went on stage and he made a joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith's hair. Jada, I love you. G.I. Jane too. Can't wait to see it. And it's well known and publicly documented that she has autoimmune disease alopecia. And in comedy, you don't punch down. It's a rule. You punch yourself or you punch up. Mm. And making fun of a woman's appearance, especially if it's due to a disability, is not okay. And then Will Smith retaliated and went up on stage and slapped him. Uh Uh-oh, Richard! (laughs) Oh, wow! Wow! Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. And I can't think of another pop culture event that has sparked so much cultural debate. Oh, it was incredible. I mean, it was... it, it, It completely showed the utter limitations of Twitter because there are so many intersecting stories and this this whole event plays so differently depending on what you bring to it mm. that when you went online seeing people, people were taking wild stabs left and right, different mm. takes, different and so dramatic and trying to cast it in very much black and white terms and and there were there was takes and counter takes and there was outrage about takes and everything was circling around and... Mm. It was a wild, old time. We discussed whether we should do a, um Instagram Live afterwards. Or even release another podcast, like an immediate reaction podcast. But ultimately you and I are both like, this is so complex. It needs time to breathe and air and play out. Totally. And I keep thinking, I can't help but think of the book The Slap, the Australian classic book, Christos Solkis, which spends an entire like 400 pages or whatever breaking down one slap and looking at it from so many different characters' perspectives, ultimately showing how all their backgrounds, economically, mm. culturally, all these different things, it completely informs different things and ultimately not coming to any conclusion other than modern life is complex. And so it was really weird to see this thing happen and then all of a sudden people jumping on 
you know, stances within the first 30 seconds, which is what sort of social media requires you to do in some ways. Yeah. I mean, you've also failed to think, remember that Chris also wrote an article, the guy who wrote <laughs> Slap also wrote an article about why the Oscars is doomed like a few days before the Oscars. So well, Yes. He, he basically said even the controversies are boring. The writer of the Slap, two days before the Oscars. I mean, you can't write this it's stuff. It's wild. It's wild. There's so many weird intersecting things that you can pick up in here. Yeah. Well, let's work through it in order. Let's work through okay. it in order. Okay. So... There's a lot to unpack and I feel enormous responsibility to cover everything and get things right because as a woman with an opinion, if I get it wrong, there will be many hot takes about my hot take and I don't want that. The headline on my hot take is that everyone loses. This isn't a situation where there's right and wrong. We have to hold space for everything. We can't have these nuanced, multi-layered, complex conversations online. Because, like you said, it's the hot take Olympics. It's the rush. Who can get the meme out? Who can get Mm. the joke out? Who can get the opinion out first and fastest rather than sitting back and taking everything in and listening to other people and forming, you know, I found it really hard to form an opinion at first. Like I said to you, I don't have one. I don't have one. I'm sorry. (laughs) I I need to read more and I need to understand the complexities and where everyone's coming from. And... You know, and eventually I just landed on that uh, we can say that, that both behaviours were shitty simultaneously. Punching down on a woman with a disability is not okay and then a man using love as an excuse for aggression is also not okay. Mm. So I think if we start from a base point of we're holding both behaviours as wrong but not downplaying the violence and not downplaying making fun of someone's disability and holding space mm. for those, the subcontext there and... I also think that this is a wider discussion about toxic masculinity because making fun of how a woman looks and then using love as an excuse to retaliate are both facets of extreme toxic masculinity and how men behave and what society accepts. So if people are walking around saying, oh, it's just a slap, it doesn't matter, what you're forgetting is in that one moment so many different people felt represented. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Disabled people, black people, black women, people who have experienced domestic violence, people Mm. who have been assaulted, people who have committed violence. Like everyone had a reason in that moment to feel like their story and maybe they felt ignored for one brief moment was being shown to the world in such a public way. And for anyone to kind of say the discourse around it is ridiculous and why are we talking about this and it doesn't matter, you're saying to all these people that in the moment have maybe finally felt like their situation has been spotlighted that they don't matter and that's why so many people have been triggered by this event Mm. that's that's kind of where I've landed yeah I had in the first 24 hours I've I've got a close friend that has some horrible experience of of domestic violence Mm. and family violence and she was incredibly affected by it and and I understand why when she explained it because some of the defining hallmarks of that experience for her are you think you're in a really safe space, a predictable space, and then everything changes and Mm. someone that you know as friendly and paternal suddenly becomes something that you didn't imagine. And, yeah, this was an award show, but the Oscars is that sort of like, you know, you just do not expect to see violence at the Oscars and Will Smith has a 30-year career of being genial. So she was intensely affected, but then I also had another friend, a woman of colour, that was saying that... To see mm-hmm. someone kick down on a woman of colour with a disability mm. and the expectation that they'll just take it and mm. smile and then to see that someone just wasn't going to take it and mm-hmm. someone was going to, you know, even if it was completely the wrong thing to do, both of those reactions were felt so viscerally mm-hmm. and and frankly there's mm-hmm. no one, there's, one doesn't cancel out the other no. at all. This is why we must evolve as a society to be able to hold things in the same space and make space for it to change and not commit this is right, this is wrong, we all must have a black and white opinion. I think the only way we can possibly grow and learn from this is to let it keep growing and evolving and giving it air and more discussions and not saying to people, no, you're wrong, violence is bad, the end. Of course it is. But what Chris Mm. Rock did to Jada Pinkett Smith, those words were an act of violence. And... I'm in no means, again, downplaying what Will Smith did, but you can't just say that was wrong without 
really exploring the layers behind it because if you don't do that, then you, you're taking away any value that people who felt represented by his actions feel about themselves. I think for white people especially to go, oh, it's, everyone's overreacting, what a privilege, you know? And we were talking about how complicated it was. So Will Smith's autobiography vividly detailed a very violent incident between his parents and he said in his speech, you know, that he dedicated it to his mother and when he won and that a lot of this moment is really complicated for me. Mm. And, and if you you don't know, like he feels and has often said he feels like a coward for not getting in the way of his father attacking his mother. And he said in his book, no matter how successful I've become, there is that subtle and silent feeling always pulsating in the back of my mind that I'm a coward. Yeah. Chapter one, first page, Jesus. And then he wins the Oscar for playing a man who was well known to have had violent tendencies towards his family. This is publicly documented about Richard Williams. And then he's defended the woman he loves using an act of violence. Can you imagine? I mean, all of that plays out as well. And then Chris Rock commenting on... Jada's hair when he made a documentary called Good Hair. This October, Chris Rock will take you back to your roots. Just yesterday, my daughter came into the house and said, Daddy, how come I don't have good hair? I wonder how she came up with that idea. Within the black community, if you have good hair, you're prettier or better than. The lighter, the brighter, the better. About how important hair is in black culture, specifically for his daughters. And the politics of black women's hair is so riddled with trauma and is so complex for that community. For him, after making a documentary for his daughters and their hair and the history of their hair. Including speaking to a woman with alopecia in quite quite a lot of sensitive detail. And then to do what he did, again, what the fuck? I don't think in the moment either of those men realised what they were unleashing. I truly don't. No. Chris Rock didn't even rehearse the joke. They were apparently all, but everyone was backstage just shocked. It was not in the script. No one knew he was doing it. He was also made fun of Jada at the Oscars before in 2016 when she boycotted, she didn't want to go because the Oscars so white year. Jada's going to boycott the Oscars. Jada boycotting the Oscars is like me boycotting Rihanna's panties. <laughs> I wasn't invited. I really caution anyone on brushing this aside as, oh, this is ridiculous, it's just famous people acting out. It's so much more than that. Yeah, it's a massive intersection of so many things for so many people. And also at the centre of it, you know, I can barely remember a time before Will Smith and I think one of the things that was just so startling about it was through all that time, you know, he has always been one of America's most loved performers, so hardworking, so sort of genial, like he was a rapper who had catchy rap songs but never swore in his raps for like 30 years. And then right 15 minutes before the absolute pinnacle of of his whole career, mm. all of a sudden he has this reaction that's going to define everything may will it going forward I don't know I still don't know whether I still don't know where this is going to be placed I think his Oscar win will always have an asterisk I think there'll always be a footnote I don't think that can ever be taken back and there's obviously there's also the layer of race attached to this which I've been reading a lot from um, black commentators which is who I really wanted to hear from I I really went and sought out all the black writers that I love and care for because Obviously, as a white person, I'm looking at it through a bias lens without even realising, and I think it's very important that, you know, we listen to the community that this directly affects first. Obviously, there's a wider community this affects. Not everyone with alopecia is black or white, or but that specific moment. And so the Academy has come forward and said that they don't condone violence of any form and they're going to be investigating the incident. And, in fact, there's a chance that Will Smith will have to give back his Oscar. And then Christy Rutherford, who's an anti-racist activist that I follow, She noted today that Harvey Weinstein has 81 Oscars, Woody Allen has four, Roman Polanski has one, Kevin Spacey has two. All of these white men have been either convicted or accused of extreme sexual assault and none of them have been made to give their Oscars back. If they haven't withdrawn it from those men, I'd be really surprised if it was going to happen. There's a lot of people speculating that if they're having their investigation, that's what it will lead to. What's so incredible about this story is that this 30-second incident has 
almost generations of backstory to it and so many different entry points. Mm. And I just don't know that there will ever be one defining version of this story. There doesn't have to be. And that's what we need to start learning. Again, Michael and I are just here to examine all the hot takes and everyone's thoughts and opinions on it. And my only strong opinion is that I will hold space for, for everything and both acts were wrong and that's it. That, and that's all I can offer as someone who is a, like a, essentially a privileged white woman who could never understand the complexities that some people are drawing from this. That's, that's all I really, I mean, and I got so many messages because I, kind of, I haven't been online because I've had other things going on and everyone wanted my opinion and I was really perplexed as to why. And then one woman said, I make up my mind after I hear what you think. <laughs> I was like, oh, God, I don't know that you should be doing that. I get it. You always have an interesting reaction to things. Like I look forward to hearing your opinion. But, yeah, I mean, absolutely, this is this is something that is incredibly complex. And yeah. You're going yeah. to hold a lot. But the night had so many like marginalised communities represented and they had success and it has been overshadowed and Adriana DeVos became the first openly queer Latinx black woman to win an Oscar for her role in West Side Story. Great speech. Oh, great speech and overlooked. What is this? Um, You know what, now you see why Taranita says I want to be in America because even in this weary world that we live in, dreams do come true. And that's really a heartening thing right now. So to anybody who has ever questioned your identity, ever, 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 or find your, you find yourself living in the gray spaces, I promise you this, there is indeed a place for us. Thank you to the Academy and thank you all. Oh, full credit for going all the way to saying, using the lyrics ah. from West Side Story, saying there is a place for us. Tears. Sad she didn't sing it, but anyway. <laughs> We've already mentioned Troy from Coda and Questlove winning for his documentary Summer of Soul. But the moment that really struck you and I will shock no one, Michael Wiggins. No, no, it will not. Please, it is, I feel like it, you describe. Well, <sighs> best picture. Oh. They often pull out the legend for best picture. Yeah. And didn't they deliver this time? Wait, can I pause you in side quest? Jamie Lee Curtis showing up with the tiny dog for the memorandum. Mem- 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 <laughs> yeah. Was for Betty White. Bonkers. I know, but it was like, of course, after someone gets slapped, after, like all these things are happening, of course there was a tiny dog on stage. <laughs> Oh, no. And also we should say after the slap, it was yeah. impossible to pay much attention to anything for the whole rest of the time. So all these strange things were happening. Chihuahuas, um, Marvel movies winning Twitter competitions. <laughs> and- oh, Cinderella, Rob. I want to point out after the slap, they did cross to the dog for the reaction. So some people got the dog's reaction shot, just so really? everyone knows. Okay, wow. I'm sorry for my side quest. Please take the stage for the greatest slash gayest campest most amazing moment. The Oscar legend. Mm-hmm. It was unveiled was Liza Minnelli in a wheelchair, led out by Lady Gaga herself. Good evening. You know how I love working with legends. Oh, my baby. <laughs> Oscar award winning actress, Liza Minnelli. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Liza was clearly very happy to be there, also clearly pretty fragile yeah. and needed a lot of help. And I think what was so striking about it, perhaps especially considering the night that we'd seen, is the kind of tenderness and support and respect that Lady Gaga showed her. Mm. Um, she just And there was this beautiful moment where um, Manelli was getting a bit flustered, mm. um, losing her way a little bit. And so Gaga threw to the nominees package and then she leant down to her and she didn't know that her mic was still on. And there was just this moment where you could hear her say, I got you. I know. Thank you. It was just, it, was, it makes me want to cry. Oh, right my God, now. I did. I did. A moment of pure love. Pure in, love. In a night of just hectic. And also, if you want to really unleash the tears, Lady Gaga mm. did Tony Bennett's last concert. He unfortunately, has very severe Alzheimer's Mm. now and can't really remember anything. Mm. But he can still sing because he learned all those songs when he was young and they wanted to do a last couple of concerts for him at Radio City Music Hall. But he needs support on stage. So Lady Gaga did it with him and there is a 60-minute segment. It is on YouTube. (laughs) And it's Lady Gaga, if you need to cry, it's Lady Gaga helping him 
rehearse and get ready and she is so tender and careful with him and it's clear tragically he doesn't know who she is all through the rehearsals but then they get on stage at Radio City Music Hall and the music plays and he comes to life and she comes out for the first time and he's forgotten her all rehearsals clearly he's been lovely to her but has no idea who she is and he (laughs) looks her in the eye and he goes Lady Gaga and she just lights up oh. and has to fight back tears. And I, honestly, I cry every single oh, time. I'm crying hearing about it so much. <laughs> and Liza, oh, I was watching the Freddie Mercury documentary that's on Ivy at the moment of his last kind of final days and the concert they put on after he died. And Liza got on stage and sung at that. And like George Michael sung, Elton John sung with uh, Axel from Guns N' Roses. Like it was an enormous concert Queen put on to honour Freddie after he died for and raised money for AIDS awareness. And Liza got on stage and her and Freddie were best friends and she was just there and I just watched that moment with Lady Gaga and I was watching Liza on stage for Freddie and, oh, God. Treasure. She must be protected at all costs. <laughs> I can't. I love her so She's much. She's just so pure compassion oh. and showbiz and sequins. Yes. And was like, wasn't she married to Peter Allen at some point? Yes. She was. God, I love it. I know. Oh, anyway, so. That could have been us, Em. Probably. I mean, don't never say never. <laughs> don't rule it out. No, I know. But yeah. Next time Scott goes on a cycling trip. Stop it. So, uh, yeah, that is our take. And also we want to point out that picture of Nicole Kidman, Michael, n- not Mm-mm. true. Well, it was from that night, but, but in not, actual fact, yeah. it's a classic picture of, and it was reprinted all around the world, was all over Twitter, Nicole Kidman gasping, and mm. it was attributed to the moment when mm. the slap happened. But in actual fact, it was her just seeing Jessica Chastain. <laughs> but I do love that Nicole has established herself as the reaction shot of the Oscars. I, mean, right. I didn't think any shot of her was going to top the infamous seal clap. Yeah. that she did when she was trying to protect her rings, <laughs> uh, which didn't come up well in the fisheye lens. We all remember it. Yes. It's all a, it's a, it's a, such a constant meme yeah. slash gif. Yeah. yeah. But it was an amazing shot. Unfortunately, not that moment, but I feel like no, it was still a great face you did, Nicole. Yeah, it's it fine. deserves to be there. Yeah, good for you, good for you. All right, well, we're going to go away. We'll take a breath, <laughs> come back, and I've finished Bridgerton. I did it in three days in some horny haze. That'll be next. Okay. <laughs> M. Rossiano and Michael Lucas. This is, 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 is M. Salation. Okay, well, obviously I'm at home recording the podcast. I'm so glad I have that very expensive studio that I actually, actually pay rent on today that I can't even use. And, Michael Lucas, you are on the Gold Coast still. I am. It's wild. <laughs> I'm here for a screen industry conference. Oh, I wonder if there'll be any incidences on stage. Well, the awards night is tonight. Oh, I'm- look out. I'm thinking no. <laughs> okay. I'm so certainly hoping no. no. No, no, no. I unabashedly love the Goldie. I know that there is this secret tradition of Melburnians that they might be all black clad and beret wearing and turtlenecks in Melbourne, but then mm. they come to the Gold Coast, they secretly love it. And I am very <laughs> much in that category. I love it. The only thing that I truly do not understand, I, and I'm going to need, okay, the daylight savings. It gets light so early here. Yeah, I love it. But not only does it get light. Like the the residents of the Gold Coast, they are up and about. Like when I I often get up early to go and write at a cafe Mm. and I go out into Northgate in Melbourne, good luck finding a cafe open before like 7.30. Gold Coast, no worries. You go out at 6 a.m., People have already exercised. Yes. <laughs> they are there. At the, what is going on? Why it. is it such an early rise? That you would love it. I do love you it. You fit in. I love the Gold Coast. I always sell out there first. They get me. They see me. I'm their spiritual I, leader. I totally. That makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah, yeah. But also the early mornings, a lot of elderly people retire and move up there. So, you know, old people I get I suppose it looks like elderly people and fit people. Yeah. And so it's the, the combination ultimate. of the two. And usually it's going to get hot, so you want to beat the heat and exercise early, and the surf is often calmer. Oh, there's a myriad of reasons. There really is. You're no, you're very hooked into all of them. 
I mean, I appreciate it because I guess I am a bit of an early riser. I just sort of think if they didn't, like, it, we we could all just agree to make this 7 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. <laughs> and then we get a bit more light at the end of the day. But maybe what I'm not taking into consideration is how hot it would be. Yeah. No, hang on. You still get the same burst of heat. Well, what? yes, but... It's nicer to get up and get everything done before the rest of the day. You know, I, 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 I subscribe to it. I love it. Now, I've been obviously locked in my bedroom, so I've done a lot of telly. I've started Young Royals. You'll be happy to know. I'm on episode two. Oh, good. How are you going with your subtitles? Oh, I was pretty tired last night, not going to lie. Uh, okay, every sure. now and then they break into English, which I'm grateful for. I'm so old. They make sure they have a hook at the end of every episode that is essentially something erotic oh. happening between the boys, so you'll never switch off. Oh, I love it. I love that relationship already. Obsessed. What I have done is ravenously consumed Bridgerton season two. It has been said that competition is an opportunity for us to rise before our greatest of challenges. This is the season the Viscount intends to find a wife. You honestly just did that. I believe I did. Can I just get a, when did you start it? What, what was the time frame? I started with the girls on Sunday. Okay. There's eight episodes. Yeah. And I finished, I would have finished sooner if I didn't have the photo shoot Monday. And I finished last night and we're all in locked in different parts of the house because I was in isolation, Odie's in isolation, Chella's just generally keeping away from us. Chella's the COVID ninja, touch wood. I am too, touch wood, touching all the wood, even though I'm not supposed to because it's my OCD. And we were sending each other pictures of our faces after watching particular episodes because I wish you've watched it. You need to watch it and we'll revisit. I, ha- I have watched the first season. No, 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 the second season specifically. No, I know, I know. Well, I'm intrigued because the Duke is not there, so you're going to really need to sell me here. The Duke isn't there. There's way less sex scenes. Really? There's hardly any. I would say three, maybe two. Goodness. And they build up between Viscount and Kate. They build up this, like, there's just so much of this. I will stop. Do not stop. I will stop. Do not stop. At one point it's like I wanted to give her some Ventolin. I, it was very Adina mm. Menzel singing Defying Gravity, the original Broadway recording. And nobody in all of us, no wizard that there is or was. Any Broadway nerd will know a lot of people take issue with Adina's breathing and her singing. I'm not one of those people, but there's whole Facebook groups dedicated to Adina Menzel's breathing. She's very like, <gasps> when she breathes. And the, the two of them, every time they're near each other, they start panting. <laughs> so that's just a lot of panting. Well, they're wearing tight corsets and you're gonna, you don't want a flush of erotic feeling if you're really strapped in. You're true. That's right. There's no gayness at all, which is a bit disappointing. Mm, okay. Completely removed all that. We did get us bear ass shot ep one. Of the Viscount. That was my next question. Yep. Okay, good. A lot yep. of bear ass. Please text time code. <laughs> <laughs> I will text time codes. But when we finally get, because everyone knows famously episode seven of season one is when we get the Duke and old mate hooking up. And was that where they did like the sex montage all around yes. the house? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember Oh, no, that. the first... The first one was when they were at the inn. You know when they finally arrive as a married couple and they, oh, yeah. they start but they don't finish because he admits that he doesn't want to like... Make her pregnant. That's right. Because she doesn't understand jizzing, the concept of jizzing. Uh, so then we finally get that. They pretty much around the same episode here. But what they do give you when the, when you're on the last episode and it's all finishing up, there's kind of like a sex montage to finish with. So Shonda knew we will probably all be feeling hot and horny and ripped off. And then just when you're about to write your angry letter to Shondaland.com, bang, you get a horny soft lensed musical string quartet pop number like oh the music oh my god we got you ought to know we got material girl we got wrecking ball (gasps) the music's amazing and and this is when they do sort of like the period style covers of the songs yes all by string quartets yeah ultimately with bridgerton season two you're not going to be reaching for the vibrator much like season Mm. one your vibrator probably, like you probably wore the battery out. Season mm-hmm. two, maybe it'll just be in your drawer and you'll maybe think about it, but 
I don't know. It, but I loved it. It made me cry a lot more than season one. You really get the backstory of Anthony Bridgerton's father and the tragic death and what that did to him and why he's become the way he is and how they coped as a family. And, yeah, there was a lot of backstory and there was a lot of more heart in this one but less cock and balls, hot, sexy, sexy time. So that's my review. <laughs> well, you can just have a bit of a minx chaser. Minx chaser for, for the cock and balls and, and young royals chaser for your gay. So well, you can still maintain a balanced diet of oh, television watching. That's what I'm doing. So I've got F1 to catch up on, obviously, that I'm doing Drag Race. I've got the Bridgerton I finished. I've got Young Royals. I'm doing, I, the, I'm doing documentaries as well. I'm doing Vikings, going back to rewatch Vikings all six seasons. So I'm really just making sure every facet of my personality and taste is catered to. <laughs> I'm proud of you, it's, I think. Okay. All right, well, you head off to your award ceremony and I will just go and frame this letter from the National Press Club that oh, I've received. Oh, please do. Yeah, we'll put it up at the Can't office. Can't wait to pay my respects for it when I, yes. when I come for it next. All right, talk soon. Bye. Bye. This is Emsolation. All right, that's all we have time for. Are you so excited about my big announcement? Are you so excited? The National Press Club. Gang, <laughs> this, the person, me, your person, your ridiculous human that you support and listen to has been invited to do this thing. I know, it's it's all of our victory and I will be including you. It, you will feel like you have an address at the National Press Club. Don't worry. And I know that you can buy tickets, I think. I don't know all the details, but I think some of you could come. It would be great to have some emsolators. If there, there are any Canberra-based emsolators or Sydney, if you want to make a drive, look out for those tickets. I want to remind you to make sure you're following us on social media. My daughter runs the Emsolation Instagram account. And if you are not following that, you're only getting half the story. It is incredible. She puts so much work into the stories. She illustrates the episodes. There's pictures there. If I mention something, she'll put it there so you don't have to worry. Because you might hear Michael and I talk about or describe a visual situation and think, oh, God, I've got to look that up. You don't. Because Marcello, it will be just go to our Instagram and it will all be there for you, neatly placed. And make sure you're on board for the newsletter. Of course, that goes out every Thursday or Friday, depending when I give Ben the intro. I've been very slack on that. If you're our pen pal, you'll get recommendations for TVs, for movies, for podcasts, everything. We've got you covered. Our live show is fast approaching two weeks' time. Melbourne, you've sold the venue out now. There are no seats left, but online registrations are not as high as I'd like. Emsolators, I know how many of you listen to this show. And so I think, you know, we need to have a talk about why haven't you secured your place to watch us live celebrate the second birthday? I want this to be huge. I want to show this to all the networks and say, look at the audience that Rossiano and Lucas can bring in. So make sure you reserve your spot. All the information is at our Instagram and it's only going to cost you like five bucks. It's five bucks. That's it. It's a cup of coffee. But it's nothing. Reserve your spot now. It's shaping up to be a great night. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. A lot of thought went into it. A lot of angst. A lot of sweaty energy poured into it. Is it glistening? As you look down at the screen you're watching it on, look down now at your, at your Spotify app or if you're in your car, is, is the screen that where it says insulation? is it like, is it a bit bleary and shh, is it got, is your radio dripping? Is your phone dripping all of a sudden? That's my infusion of my anxiety sweat. You're welcome. You're welcome, Emsolators. All right, until next week and God knows what's going to happen between now and then. Who knows? I dare think. Have a great week. Stay safe. Hold space. Be weird. It's okay. Oh God, I'm so Brene Brown. Does she say that? Hold space. Be weird. Is that hers? If not, on mine. It's mine. Copyright me. Does she say it? Hold space. Be weird. That's mine. I'm climbing it. I'm sure one of you let me know if I've stolen it. Probably have. Baggers. Oh, done it again. Bagang. Emsolation with M. Rossiano is a Spotify exclusive podcast recorded at Down the Hill Studios, hosted by M. Rossiano with Michael Lucas, executive produced by Benjamin Wosley, produced by M. Rossiano, edited by Ezekiel Fenn at Entente Music, with videos by James Henderson, socials by Marcella Rossiano Barrow, with assistance from Jem Evans and Georgia Watts, plus 
Plus, occasional off-a-shelf installs and flat pack wrangling from M's Dad Vinci. Get more M Salation by following us on Instagram at M Salation Podcast. You can also sign up for our weekly newsletter. Join other M Salators at the M Salation Group on Facebook. The answer is Harry Styles. And please take the time to share this podcast with a friend and make sure you're following us on the Spotify app by hitting the follow button. Thanks again for taking time out to listen to this week's episode and we look forward to chatting with you again soon. <laughs>